Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Hello, I am Saurabh Sharma, Assistant Professor in the School of Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences, Chanakya University, Bengaluru. Lecture number 10, Transition of China to Market Socialism. The transition of China from a Maoist socialist economy to a market socialist economy is a very interesting saga. So today we are going to discuss in details how China shifted from the Mao Zedong ideology towards a market oriented ideology. So briefly let us uh, discuss the legacy of Mao Zedong. So China for centuries and millennia had been governed by the Confucian ideas. So there was a Confucian order that functioned within China and this Confucian order was basically based on imperial authority. There was an emperor who was the son of considered to be the son of heaven who used to rule over China. The society was uh, hierarchical in nature with uh, the gentry forming the top of the hierarchy. And uh, there were some relationships which are considered very important, which were also hierarchical in nature. For example, emperor and the subjects, father, son. So basically, and husband, wife. So basically, it was a patriarchal uh, system that existed in, in, in Confucian China. Now towards the end of the 19th century, this Confucian order began to decline because of the western powers and Japan gradually began to dominate China. As a result, uh, the power of the Confucian elite began to decline and many young people came up in China, scholars and uh, politically active people who started promoting modernizing ideas that China had to transform itself from Confucian ideas to modern western ideas and uh, the Confucian elite tried to reform the system. There were several movements to reform uh, the imperial system, but it eventually failed. The system was not reformed and finally there was a revolution known as the Sinai revolution in 1911-1912 led by Sun Yat-sen. Now Sun Yat-sen proposed a new direction for China based on three principles of the people, nationalism, democracy and people's livelihood or welfare, which was uh, uh, basically uh, an idea based on uh, Abraham Lincoln's definition of democracy, the government of the people, by the people and for the people. So it was based, uh, a western uh, influence idea. In the intellectual circles, there was something known as the new culture movement, which was becoming popular. So the main ideas inspiring the new culture movement were science and democracy. They wanted to discard the old Confucian cosmology, Confucian way of looking at history, the classical Chinese way of uh, interpreting history and culture and adopting scientific principles, scientific methods. And as far as the government system was concerned, uh, discard uh, authoritarianism and adopt democratic principles so that people have more say in the governance. So these two movements were very popular in, in, in China. Basically, uh, Sinai revolution led to overthrow of the imperial government, the dynastic government and establishment of the Republic of China. And the new culture movement led to a cu cultural transformation within China. But uh, in the First World War, China faced certain setbacks. The Germans had a colony in China, which uh, the Japanese quickly took advantage of and captured as the uh, Germans were fighting in Europe. And the Japanese refused to give it up. In fact, they made 21 demands on the Chinese government because they felt that uh, you know, they had the right to colonized China, just like other imperial powers, uh, western colonial powers had uh, colonized other parts of the world. So because for Japan hardly anything left 
except a large uh, territory of China and China was weak and Japan took advantage of it. And the Western powers, because Japan was their ally, did not uh, side with China, they remained quiet. Uh, in fact, in the Treaty of Versailles, the Japanese uh, conquest of the German colony was in, in, in Shantong was, uh, was, was accepted. And so, uh, the Chinese people started becoming disillusioned with the uh, West and with Japan. And they started looking towards the Soviet Union, because in 1917, I mean, the Russia had Bolshevik Revolution and Soviet Union was established. And uh, the Chinese felt that th this was a new wave of ideas which could uh, lead to the liberation of China and, and uh, establishment of a modern uh, state in China based on uh, the Marxist uh, principles. The Soviets also showed interest. The Communist International sent their agents in China and in 1921, the Chinese Communist Party was established. Mao was one of the founding members of the Chinese Communist Party. The main leaders at that time were Chan Tu Shu and Li Ta Chao. Uh, there was slightly an, a kind of a difference in the orientation of the two uh, leaders. Chan Tu Shu was more of an orthodox uh, Marxist. He believed that the proletariat should lead the revolution. And he was also uh, more keen on following the line set by the Comintern or the Communist International. And, uh, and Sun Yat-sen, of course, was the leader of uh, 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 the re revolutionaries in China. He, he, he had formed a party called the Kuomintang. So, mediated by the Communist International, so Communist International, Comintern, the party formed by Sun Yat-sen is Kuomintang and the CCP. Okay, so, these are the three main players. So, the Kuomintern mediated a, an alliance between Kuomintang and CCP, led by Sun Yat-sen. The members of the Communist Party joined the Kuomintang and this was known as the United Front. So, Mao of course was also part of this. But once Sun Yat-sen died, the new leader Chiang Kai-shek, he was not very pro-communist, he, he, he was against the communist and he gradually began to isolate the communist and in 1927, he started the purge of the communists from his party. And uh, the communist party had, then had to go, go through the long march and uh, settle in a place known as Yan'an, which was in the interior of China. And during this period, Mao Tse Tung emerged as the undisputed leader of the communist. He was able to, you know, become more popular among the communist party cadre because of his ideas. He, basically, his ideas were that of a peasant revolution. The orthodox communist line was that uh, the, uh, the revolution will be led by the industrial workers. That is what Santoshu believed in. Uh, Mao, Mao's ideas were closer to those of Li Ta Chao. Li Ta Chao also had advocated because vast majority of the people in China are the peasants. And China did not have a very large industrial base, so the number of workers were very limited. And therefore, it, it won't, wouldn't be possible for the workers to lead a revolution like it was done in, in the Soviet Union or Soviet Russia. And uh, so, the peasantry should be considered a revolutionary class. Mao believed in that particular line. But the other communists, many of them influenced by the Soviet Union, you know, did not understand this, this idea. Uh, and, and during the Yan'an period, Mao gradually became popular among the peasants, introducing land reforms. And he was also a military genius and he was able to, you know, organize the People's Liberation Army under his leadership. As a result, he was able to marginalize all other leaders and emerged as the undisputed leader of the Chinese Communist Party by 1945. So, this was the period when the Second World War was going on. Japan, uh, Germany, Italy were together against the Allied powers and eventually J uh, Japan was defeated. During the war, the Kuomintang and the Communist Party of China again came together because of a foreign occupation. 
But once the Japanese were defeated and uh, China again became free, there was a civil war between the Kuomintang and the Chinese Communist Party in which Mao's tactics of uh, peasant revolution, land reforms and guerrilla warfare came out, uh, became successful, of course with the help of the Soviet Union which had occupied the northern part of China which they handed over to the communist. So taking advantage of all this, the Kuomintang was defeated and, and, and Chiang Kai-shek with his government had to go into exile on the island of Taiwan and the rest of China came under the communist under Mao Zedong and he established the People's Republic of China on 1st of October 1949. So as per the communist policy he introduced land reforms. So the land uh, was taken away from the landlords and the rich peasants and, and then distributed am among the, uh, the poorer peasants and the landless laborers. Uh, this led to uh, execution of several uh, millions of landlords. Okay, there were sessions where they were they, they were forced to criticize themselves, and and uh, uh, you know often it 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 became violent, and they were tortured and executed by the peasant themselves or the Communist Party cadre. So in this way, a vi very violent uh, land re redistribution was done in China. But as a result, the agriculture plots became smaller. That led to decrease in productivity. So Mao decided on the next step of uh, socialist uh, revolution, that is collectivization of the land. Gradually, the farmers were asked to pull together their, their land implements and animals and formed mutual aid teams. These mutual aid teams then uh, were basically a few families coming together for uh, agriculture together and then gradually the mutual aid teams were put together into cooperatives and then finally the highest stage was of people's commune which came about in the in about 1958 uh, so on about 20,000 people's commune was, were formed at that time and gradually the number of people's commune kept on increasing so this was the collectivization process private property was eliminated and uh, you know common kitchens were formed common nurseries were established to bring up children so this was a big kind of a social experiment done by mao zedong now uh, mao was very ambitious after the death of stalin in 1953 the new leadership of soviet union uh, started a de-stalinization process they believed that stalin had committed a lot of atrocities and therefore there was a need to remove this personality cult of uh, Stalin and go for a more collective type of leadership. And Mao was very skeptical of this. And he thought that China should not follow the Soviet line and try to become independent. And in the absence of Stalin, there, was not, uh, there wasn't a very, very powerful leader. Khrushchev eventually emerged as the leader of Soviet Union. Uh, but he was not as powerful as Stalin. And so Mao thought that China should... Uh, embark on a new path of socialism best based on Chinese conditions. And so he launched a plan known as the Great Leap Forward. The Great Leap Forward. His aim was to very quickly increase agricultural production in, in China as well as industrial production. He said that within 15 years we, we shall overtake Britain and compete with the Americans. So that is what Mao thought. And he mobilized the entire uh, country uh, to, to achieve uh, those plans. Now, now, now the thing was that so, uh, Mao believed that China did not have enough resources like the Soviet Union to uh, base their uh, industrialization and increase, produ increase productivity on, on material resources. So he, he emphasized more on the will of the people, that if the people have the will, if people work hard, uh, if people have the right spirit, then those goals could be achieved. Unfortunately, the Great Leap Forward le led to a big disaster. About 30 million, this is the kind of a uh, median value that I have taken, 30 million deaths were caused by the Great Leap Forward because there were famines, floods, droughts, you know, many people were executed 
and uh, you know the central leadership was unaware of it because uh, the party carders sent positive reports because they had to meet certain targets and they were sending reports to Beijing that that the targets were being met but uh, the reality was something different and eventually when the party leadership became aware of it Mao was Mao Zedong was gradually sidelined uh, he, he resigned from his post as the chairman of the People's Republic of China. He retained his leadership of uh, the Communist Party and the People's Liberation Army. But the day-to-day -day government function, he withdrew uh, from that. And uh, a new leader, Liu Shaoqi, became the chairman. Or what we today say in uh, many countries call as president. So they did not have the title of president, but instead had chairman. Tang Xiaoping was... Uh, a comrade of Liu Shaoqi, he was also uh, part of the new leadership. Now their idea was to, in, in order to increase productivity, instead of relying on revolutionary uh, concepts, they should rely on incentives. So if the workers or the peasants, they worked harder, performed better, they should get better pay. As a result, they will be incentivized to work harder. As a result, productivity will increase. And so it, it actually worked and gradually, Chinese economy began to recover from the great leap forward. But Mao, he felt isolated. He, he did not like uh, the, the success of uh, these policies because he thought that these policies were capitalistic policies. Okay, this whole idea of uh, competition and trying to uh, work harder and earning more was against the egalitarian principles of socialism. And uh, so, after a brief period of laying the groundwork, in 1966, Mao launched the Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution. So he invited students and young people to come on the streets, protest and attack the party officials whom he uh, blamed to be uh, corrupt and uh, basically uh, he, he said that they lean towards capitalism. He called Liu Shaoqi and Tang Xiaoping as capitalist roaders. And these red, red guards, the young, young, youngsters and the students, they were called the red guards. They attacked the various party officials, state officials, they attacked their teachers, even uh, parents, you know, and they were paraded in the streets, there were criticisms, beatings, insults, and even executions. And there was a lot of anarchy within China because of that. So what they were saying is they wanted to attack the four olds. These olds were culture, ideas, customs and habits. So they attacked say old temples, uh, even, even the graves of uh, you know, emperors were uh, attacked. Uh, they were dug out and paraded in streets, their mock trials and all those things happened. The main target of this uh, movement was Liu Shaoqi, the, the president or the chairman of uh, the People's Republic of China. Uh, he was uh, arrested, he was beaten up by the students, he was kept in confinement for a couple of years, he was denied medical treatment and eventually Liu Shaoqi, he died. So a lot of anarchy un under the Red Guards. So Mao had to call in the People's Liberation Army to control the situation. Situation had gone out of control. And he asked the Red Guards to go to the countryside. So he asked them, leave the cities, go to the countryside, learn from the peasants. Okay, this was an important idea uh, called mass line that was propagated by Mao. Mass line. That is, knowledge was not uh, the monopoly of uh, educated people a lot of knowledge among the peasants. So uh, peasants were a revolutionary class and so if you want to understand revolution, you should go and learn from the peasants. So these red guards were all sent to the countryside and gradually the PLA was called in, led by Lin Piao. Lin Piao was the defense minister of China. So he, he became a very powerful figure during this period and he was designated as the successor of Mao. Other leading figure during this period were uh, Chan Pota and Kang Shang. Chan Pota was a theorist. He, he wrote a lot of uh, articles and tried to uh, you know, theorize Marxism-Leninism and, and, uh, in, in support of the cultural 
revolution. Gradually, by 1970, he, he, he lost favor and he was removed from his position. Kang Sheng was a very powerful uh, bureaucrat. He was the head of the public security department and he played a very important role throughout the cultural revolution. The other important uh, personalities were the Gang of Four. The Gang of Four was led by the wife of Mao Zedong, Chiang Ching. And they basically, the Gang of Four were uh, more in, in the line of culture and cinema and and, and uh, you know, building a whole narrative around the cultural revolution. They were the biggest supporters of the cultural revolution and very close to Mao Zedong. They were very, very loyal to Mao Zedong. They, it said more loyal than the uh, leader himself. Now, uh, Lin Piao, as he was the designated successor, was very close to Mao, but it was always dangerous to be the number two of Mao. Before Lin Piao, it was Liu Shaoqi who was the number two. And, uh, you know, it was a very uneasy position because you never knew when uh, Mao would grow suspicious of you and, and try to remove you because uh, the number one is always threatened by the number two. And Lin Piao also realized that he was gradually being, uh, you know, Mao was becoming more and more suspicious of him and his power was declining and his life was also under threat. So he decided that he could. Uh, because he was a defense minister and he had very good ties with the military generals. And so he decided to stage a coup after assassinating Mao in 1971. But Mao with the help of Zhou Enlai who was the premier of China, the first premier of China. So he had been premier since 1949. Uh, Zhou Enlai somehow had saved himself from all the purges that Mao was doing. Uh, he always remained number three, he never became number two. And so he saved himself. Uh, and so he had remained the premier. With the help of Cho and Lai and some loyal generals, Mao was able to survive the attempts at his life. And once he, he uh, took control of power again, he uh, decided to get rid of Lin Piao. Lin Piao tried to escape in, in, a, in an air aircraft, uh, but his aircraft crashed in Mongolia under suspicious circumstances. Uh, one of the theories is that uh, it had run out of oil and uh, he wanted basically to escape into uh, to Soviet Union, but he basically failed and died. Now, this was also a time uh, of shift in foreign policy. In the 1960s, uh, China had become alienated from the Soviet Union. As I, as I had said before, that China was taking a separate kind of a line. It did not want to uh, remain subordinate to the Soviet Union. And the 60s, they uh, basically followed Mao's idea of three worlds model that both Soviet Union and United States are imperialist powers. And that is the first world. Then second world is uh, are those powers which uh, are under the so either Soviet Union or, um, or America. That is Western Europe and Japan under United States and Eastern Europe under the Soviet Union. That was the second world. And then there was a third world. Uh, including countries like China, India and so on and both these imperial powers were trying to take over the third world. And so, it was the duty of China as the leader of the third world to follow an independent line. So, that is what uh, prevailed uh, in, in China, the three worlds theory in the 1960s. Uh, situation became so bad with the Soviet Union because China and Soviet Union shared a boundary that in 1969, there was a conflict. Almost you can say it was a war between the two uh, uh, powerful countries. And, uh, and China realized that they needed to do something in order to protect themselves against Soviet Union. Suppose if America and Soviet Union decided to you know, overthrow, if they decide to come together and consider China as a common enemy and try to overthrow the regime, uh, it could be the end of uh, uh, the rule of Mao Zedong. And so, with the help of Cho and Lai, and this is the whole, whole story we are going to discuss in, in the foreign policy lectures about this, uh, Chinese started the rapprochement with, with the Americans. Henry Kissinger, he came to China on a secret visit and then eventually Richard Nixon, the American president visited China and there were certain agreements made between the two countries. 
China became uh, joined the United Nations as a permanent member of the Security Council, which US did not veto. And uh, you know, they decided to form an understanding so that Soviet Union would not be able to dominate the, the region. So, Cho and Lai, this was the peak of Cho and Lai's career. Cho and Lai became very powerful. With Lin Piao removed, he was basically now the number two. Now, Cho and Lai was never very comfortable with the Cultural Revolution. So, he tried to rehabilitate a lot of uh, people who were persecuted during this, this time. And one of those, those leaders was Tan Xiaoping, as I have already mentioned him before. So, Liu Shaoqi, of course, was killed uh, during this uh, movement. Uh, Tang Xiaoping escaped. He, he basically was sent to work in a factory as a worker and he survived the threat to his life. He was able to survive it. Of course, he was punished. His family also suffered, but his life was not lost. So, uh, Cho and Lai was able to convince Mao to bring back Tang Xiaoping into the government because he was a very efficient administrator. So, in 1974, Tang Xiaoping was rehabilitated and given important positions within the government and he was able to handle the administration very effectively. But this was not to the liking of the Gang of Four. Chiang Ching was very uh, wary of uh, Tang Xiaoping. In fact, she was also wary of Cho and Lai. And uh, on the advice of the Gang of Four, uh, Mao you know, sidelined Cho and Lai. In fact, he used Tang Xiaoping to criticize Cho and Lai. And uh, in the 1970s, uh, 1974, 75, there was a criticized Lin Piao, criticized Confucius movement. So, Lin Piao, of course, was the uh, subject of criticism, but Confucius was also criticized. Now, this was a way of criticizing Cho and Lai, because Cho and Lai was. Uh, externally a kind of a Confucian figure, very quiet, straight, very good administrator, you know. So, that was a typical uh, Confucian bureaucratic image. And uh, so, Cho and Lai was in this way criticized because Mao was uh, to an extent, uh, you can say jealous of Cho and Lai of his popularity because Mao created a lot of enemies by, by persecuting people, but Cho and Lai always tried to protect. Uh, the members, his comrades, the members of the Communist Party. And therefore, Cho Enlai was also very popular. You can say more liked than Mao. Mao was feared, but Cho Enlai was actually liked by the cadre of the Communist Party. Uh, Cho Enlai died in 1976. Okay, and and uh, after that, Tang Xiaoping, he, he, he did not have any patron. And so, he was also sidelined by Mao again. He was purged again from all his positions. But uh, Mao did not appoint uh, any member of the Gang of Four to, to, to uh, the position of Premier after Chou Enlai died. Instead, he appointed Hua Kuofeng, who was considered to be a very lightweight uh, member. He was, he was not a very powerful member within the Communist Party. He belonged to the Yunnan province of Mao. In fact, he looked uh, a bit like Mao himself. And uh, Mao felt that he was very loyal to him uh, and also very cool headed, unlike the gang of four who were although very loyal to Mao, but they were very radical and they created a lot of enemies. And so he, he thought that Hua Kuofeng would be better at handling the situation. So Mao appointed him as the premier. And just before dying, he also appointed him as his successor. So, once Mao died in 1976, after a few months after Cho and Lai, uh, Huo Kuo Feng succeeded him as the new leader of the Communist Party. So, he became the premier as well as the uh, chairman of the Communist Party. Okay. So, this created after that of Mao an ideological triangle. Okay, so, there were three basic power centers now. One of course, was the leader, the new leader, chairman and premier Huo Kuo Feng. This is the one of the angles of the triangle. The other was the gang of four, the supporters of the cultural revolution led by 
Chiang Ching, the wife of Mao. The other members of uh, Gang of Four have been mentioned here, Chang Chun Chiao, Yao Wen Yuan and Wang Hung Wen. So these were the Gang of Four who are the biggest supporters of the cultural revolution. They believe that cultural revolution should continue. And then there were the veterans of the communist movement led by Tang Xiaoping. Okay, these were later on came to be known as the eight immortals. Okay, Tang Xiaoping, Yang Shangkung, Chen Yun, Li Xiannian, Peng Chen, Wang Chen, Po Yi Po, Sung Ren Chiong. So these were the veterans, who the, those people who had uh, participated in a long march, who had fought against the Kuomintang, fought against the Japanese, who had uh, founded the, uh, the People's Republic of China. So, so these people had more power than Hua Kuofang or the Gang of Four, because they had influence on the People's Liberation Army, the military. And... Uh, Hua Kuofeng, of course, anybody who becomes a leader ha gets a certain coterie around him. So he had certain supporters. Uh, he was helped by one of the marshals of the People's Liberation Army, Ye Chianing, who helped him to get rid of the Gang of Four. So soon after becoming the leader, Hua Kuofeng, he he organized a sort of a coup. He, he, without any, any, any serious bloodshed, he was able to you know, uh, put the Gang of Four into a sense of security because they used to be very powerful under Mao. And they didn't think Huo Kuo Feng was so loyal to Mao would, would betray them. A and, and so they were uh, very comfortable. They were not uh, worried about their own security. But Huo Kuo Feng, with the help of the security agencies and the military, arrest the Gang of Four and remove them completely from power. Now, Hua Kuofeng, he advocated a policy known as the two whatevers. So, although he removed the gang of four, he, he, he said that we will resolutely upheld whatever policy decisions Chairman Mao made and unswaveringly follow whatever instruction Chairman Mao gave. So, this is known as two whatevers. Basically, you are saying Whatever Chairman Mao said was correct, whatever Chairman Mao did was correct and we are going to continue to follow it. Despite of taking actions against uh, the Gang of Four, he refused to criticize the Cultural Revolution. But he was not as powerful as the veterans led by Tang Xiaoping. And so gradually, you know, they, they became more powerful. Uh, Hua Kuofeng uh, rehabilitated Tang Xiaoping again in 1977. Tang Xiaoping was restored to his old positions in the party. But he was critical of Hua, Hua Kuofeng's uh, two whatevers. He said, if the two whatevers are correct, then uh, uh, what is the point of rehabilitating him? And if cultural revolution was not wrong, then uh, whatever Mao did, uh, should not be undone. How, how are the gang of four wrong in, in that case? He said that this type of idea has not been propagated by any uh, anyone, uh, uh, neither Marx, nor Engels, nor Lenin, nor Mao Zedong himself has advocated any such whatever policy. Uh, so, so he was critical of Hua Kuo Feng. And by 1978, Tang Xiaoping emerged as the main leader of Chinese Communist Party. He became the paramount leader with the help of his comrades within the military and the uh, party. Now, I briefly want to mention some of the atrocities committed by the Gang of Four during the Cultural Revolution. Gang of Four plus Mao himself actually is to be blamed. Now, uh, this is Chiang Ching, the, the wife of Mao and this is Sun Wei Shi. Uh, she was the adopted daughter of Chou Enlai. You know, the, the Red Guards did not spare the leaders of Communist Party nor their families. Now, this is one of the most uh, heinous type of a crimes committed during the Cultural Revolution. Now, for this is a younger picture of Shun Wei Shi. Uh, Chiang Ching and Shun Wei Shi were rivals. Both were actresses 
and uh, Sun Weisha, she was the daughter of a revolutionary and Cho and Lai, the, uh, the premier had adopted her from a young age. And so, so she was the daughter of Cho and Lai. Now she was a very successful actress, she also married a, a film actor. Now Chiang Ching was always jealous of her. So during the cultural revolution, Cho and Lai sent uh, Sun Weisha uh, to a safe location to, to escape the uh, Red Guards. But Chiang Ching, she arranged that uh, a message was sent to her that her father had become sick and she should return to Peiching. And so she returned without suspecting anything. And uh, she was caught by uh, the, uh, the goons of uh, Chiang Ching and she was uh, repeatedly tortured and murdered. And uh, Chiang Ching was so jealous of her, she got her body to be burned and, uh, and thrown away. And so no signs of her remained. It is only after the end of Cultural Revolution that this was discovered. Besides that, uh, some other incidents are uh, the, the son of Tang Xiaoping, Tang Fu Fang. He was a student in Peking University. He was thrown from the third floor of the university building and he was paralyzed for life because of that. This was done by the Red Guards. And then uh, another incident is uh, Wang Kuang Mei. This is actually the photograph of that particular incident. She was the wife of Liu Shaoqi. So she was the first lady of China. And the Red Guards then dressed her up with all kinds of props here as you can see and uh, called her a prostitute and paraded her, insulted her in public. Okay, so these are some of the atrocities committed during the Cultural Revolution. So people are already fed up with all, all these uh, persecutions and therefore Huo Kuo Feng was successful in overthrowing the Yang of This is Huo Kuo Feng. But he was not as powerful as Tang Xiaoping. So eventually uh, Tang Xiaoping emerged as the leader of China. And the meeting in which he, he took over power is the third plenum of the 11th Central Committee. This meeting was held from the 18th to 22nd of December 1978. So in this particular meeting, Hua Kuo Fang was gradually sidelined from power and Tang Xiaoping emerged as the undisputed leaders. So Hua was praised for taking action against the Gang of Four, but his two whatevers were criticized. They were declared to be mistaken idea. Mao himself was scrutinized, his ideas were scrutinized, his actions were scrutinized. And basically they said that Mao as a whole was correct, he was our leader, he, he liberated China and created this communist party state, but he made certain mistakes and these mistakes of Mao were criticized, especially his personality cult that he has created. Hua Kuo Fang had also tried to create a personality cult and so that was also criticized. Cultural revolution was severely criticized and all uh, uh, the actions taken against the communist leaders like Tang Xiaoping, they were all considered to be wrong ideas. Okay. So basic formula that was applied was Mao was 70 percent right and 30 percent wrong. This is the same uh, formula applied by Mao himself on Stalin. When Stalin died, Mao had declared that Stalin was 70 percent right and 30 percent wrong. So Tang Xiaoping applied the same principle on Mao. Another important point was this whole concept of revolution in a, in, a, in a socialist society was completely discarded. So once a revolution has been done, the, uh, the meeting uh, argued that there is no need for continuing with the revolutionary process. What was needed was modernization. Now Cho and Lai had given a formulation known as four modernizations, agriculture, industry, science and technology and military. So in a socialist society, the goal according to Tang Xiaoping and uh, his, uh, his followers, basically we can call them the pragmatists or the elders, the party elders, they decided that the focus should not be on revolution in, in, a, in a socialist society because revolution has already been achieved. The bourgeois has been overthrown and communist party is the ruling party. So what is the need of uh, you know, targeting the superstructure? as Mao was saying because he believed that although the base had changed, the eco economic system had changed, 
the mindset had not changed. So, so they discarded all these ideas. They said that the focus should be on productive forces, okay, in order to make China into a modern socialist country. So, focus should be on four modernizations. And they took some of the uh, ideas from uh, Mao's writings and, and said that should be the focus. First is emancip em emancipating the mind, okay, give up this whole suspicion and jealousy and, 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 and be more open minded towards your comrades. Then seeking truth from facts, you should not be dogmatic. Okay, you should not just uh, focus on, on the writings of Mao Zedong. Instead, instead look at uh, the actual conditions of society, uh, try to improve the conditions of society. This was the argument that Mao himself had made during the Yan'an period, when he had said that, uh, uh, you know, you should not copy the Soviet model and blindly follow Marxism-Leninism. Instead, uh, China, because it's a peasant society, should focus on a peasant revolution by seeking truth from facts. So, Tang Xiaoping reaffirmed that idea that now because China is a socialist country, there was no need for these revolutionary movements. Instead, there should be stability and focus should be on economic development. And finally, unity. There should be unity within the party. There should not be factions within the party. Okay, only if China is united, then China can achieve its goal. China can then protect itself from his enemies. Okay, so, so, this third plenum of the 11th Central Committee of the Communist Party was a very important event in the history of China. Now, gradually, Tang Xiaoping, you know, he cultivated a new generation of leadership and uh, China adopted a model which came to be known as socialism with Chinese characteristics. Let me quickly go through these. First is end justifies the means. So, ultimate goal is building a modern socialist country. So, it does not matter whether the cat is white or black, so long as the cat catches mice. This is a quote from Tang Xiaoping. Second, no grand strategy. Okay, cross the river by feeling the stones. Gradually, stepwise, you, you, you may commit some mistakes, improve, take another step forward, so on. Gradual reforms. Reform should be gradually done and not pushed just like a great leap forward when Mao believed that within 15 years they are going to overtake Britain. That should not be the process. Instead, China should gradually try to reform its economy. Zero tolerance to political mobilization and deviations. So, because these elders were uh, uh, disliked the whole uh, cultural revolution and this whole uh, mobilization of the masses, they were completely against it and uh, they in fact suppressed any people's movement after that. They said that power should be concentrated in the hands of the government and there should be no deviation from the strict line taken by the, by the party, which came to be known as the four cardinal principles. Okay, so, so, basically the idea was there was one central task that was economic development. And to achieve this central task or economic development, there are two points need to be followed. One is, one was reform and opening up, that is Chinese economy should open up and reform itself in order to achieve economic development. Secondly, four cardinal principles or in other words, the leadership of the communist party should always be followed. Okay, the four uh, cardinal principles are basically these as you can see, the socialist road people's democratic dictatorship, this was the idea given by Mao, leadership of the communist party and Marxism, Leninism and Mao Zedong thought. So, China will not deviate from these four principles, but it will reform its economy, introduce market into its, into its economy. Okay. So, these are some of the reforms, you can see here, these are some of the economic reforms introduced during the 1980s. First was the household responsibility system. Okay. So, Mao had collectivized the land in China and so there was initially there was a momentum, there was increase in agricultural production, but gradually because of lack of incentives, because no one owned the farms and no one was responsible for the production. So, gradually the productivity began to decline and people did not have 
enough to eat, there was a lot of suffering. And so, one of the reforms introduced by Tang, uh, these ideas basically came from some of the young reformers that he had uh, uh, supported. Uh, for example, Hu Yao Pang and Zhou Xiang. Uh, I think I have their photos here. This is Hu Yao Pang and this is Chao Xiang. So, anyway, so household responsibility system meant that uh, the agricultural land was divided among households. Instead of a collective farm, farms were divided and given to households and they were made responsible. So, they were given uh, the land on lease for a few years and they were asked to increase productivity. And if, if they produce more than the quota, then they could they were allowed to sell their produce in the market. As a result, there was an incentive to increase production. And because of this, agricultural production began to increase and people had more food to eat. And uh, the suffering of the people reduced because of this household responsibility system. Then town and village enterprises were encouraged to increase productivity. Uh, people were asked to set up small production units keeping in mind the export market. You know many of the things that we buy, many of the Chinese goods, they come from these town and village enterprises which are not very big uh, industries, but very small production units which, which produce things like dolls and uh, consumer goods, small consumer goods. Now these were encouraged by Tang Xiaoping and that led to increase in industrial production. Then of course there were these large state owned enterprises they were also uh, a, a kind of a focus. Now, the larger production, the, the more complicated, technologically complicated production was handled by the state owned enterprises. Then, uh, Tang created certain special economic zones in the coastal areas of China. Okay, these uh, special economic zones or SCZs, they allowed for foreign direct investment. Okay, so so, there was not a, not a lot of investment from the government. What the government did was, it liberalized the laws in these SCZs, reduced the taxation there, so that foreign investment could come in and uh, through foreign investment or FDI, industrialization of China could be done and it was immensely successful, which led eventually to the formation of what came to be known as the socialist market economy. Okay, large FDI coming into China, lot of economic growth and uh, China becoming a larger and larger economy in this process. Okay, so, these are some of the economic reforms introduced by the reformers. Okay, there are some other points here. Uh, one, uh, I, I, I would not be able to discuss each one of them, each and every one of them, but the last point, difference with perestroika and glasnost. In the 80s, even the Soviet Union under Mikhail Gorbachev tried to reform the Soviet economy. He introduced perestroika and glasnost, but they were not very successful. Now, the difference was from Chinese uh, uh, policy that Gorbachev tried to impose this suddenly. You know, he suddenly tried to reform the Soviet economy and along with uh, reform in the economy, he also introduced political reforms. As a result, he was unable to handle the situation. A lot of forces, powerful political forces came into being and, uh, and the Soviet Union eventually collapsed. In China, Tang Xiaoping was very careful. He did not allow any political reforms. Power was strictly in the hand of the Communist Party, but he introduced gradual economic reforms, okay, stepwise reforms. And therefore, the Chinese reforms were more stable and more successful than the Soviet reforms. Okay, some other points are also there, they are also very important, but uh, there is scarcity of time. Now, some of these I have already discussed. You know, I, I talked about the four modernizations. There was also an idea of a fifth modernization. A young uh, student, Wei Ching Sheng, he said that there should be a fifth modernization called democracy. So, economic reform should also be accompanied by political reforms. And some of the young reformers, who Yao Pang and Chao Xiang were a bit of sub, bit supportive towards this view, especially who Yao Pang, 
who was supportive. Hu Biaopang by this time had become the party chairman, he replacing uh, Hua Kuofang who was, in fact, uh, uh, it is important to mention that unlike Mao, Tang Xiaoping did not persecute his rivals. You know, Hua Kuofang in 1978 had become marginalized, but he was allowed to retain his position as premier and the chairman. He was not immediately removed from power. Gradually, he was retired. So, in 1980, he was replaced as the premier by Chao Chiang. And in 1981, he was re replaced as the party chairman by Hu Yao Pang. In fact, he remained a member of the central committee, I think, till uh, 2004. Okay, so, uh, so, he was allowed to re retain his position and gradually he was sidelined. And 1982, new constitutions were introduced uh, to China. We are going to discuss in some later lectures. But Hu Yaopang, you know, he, he lost the favor of Tang Xiaoping because he was very supportive of political reforms. And in 1987, there were some student demonstrations demanding uh, more democracy, permission to criticize the Communist Party, and Hu Yaopang was uh, was hesitant to take action against the students, and so he was removed from power and replaced by Chao Chiang. Chao Chiang was also a reformer; he was the premier at that time. So Hu Yaopang was replaced, and Tang did not want to bring in some uh, people with some other ideas. So he he thought that. Chao Chiang would be more uh, compliant than Hu Yaopang, so he br made him the, the uh, chairman or, or the, by that time the post uh, had been renamed as general secretary. So, he was made the general secretary of the party and Li Peng who was a very cautious uh, socialist type of a leader, he was made the premier. In fact, 1987 was a time when Chinese economic growth became to slow down a bit. Now, in 1989, Hu Yaopang died of natural causes and suddenly people and students came uh, gathered uh, in, in, in uh, you know condolence for his death and this turned into a movement known as Tiananmen Square movement. So, 15th April he died and people started gathering in the Tiananmen Square in, 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 in Beijing and Chao Xiang who was the uh, leader of the party. he. Uh, he refused to take strong actions against against the people gathered there. Now he, he in fact he went to the students and he said, "The students, we have come too late. We are sorry. We have we are old and we don't matter anymore. But your lives matter. So please peacefully uh, go back to your homes." And this was unacceptable to the party elders. You know they uh, basically uh, replace our Chao Chiang immediately with uh, a new leader. Chiang Zemin and military action was taken. We do not know how many people died during this uh, uh, massacre, Tiananmen Square massacre of 1989. And uh, reforms were gradually you know put on the back burner and more emphasis was put on political stability. Tang Xiaoping slowed down the economic reforms, but he was committed to economic reforms. He believed that China was in the primary stage of socialism. Okay, so, for the next say about 100 years, China should focus on economic development and for that foreign investment and markets were essential. And uh, in order to maintain political stability, economic reforms were slowed down. But then in 1992, uh, Tang Xiaoping went on what is known as the southern tour. He went uh, to the southern parts of China and there he declared that economic reforms would continue and this was a signal to uh, Xiang Zemin that he should continue with the economic reform started by Hu Yaopang and uh, Chao Xiang. And so, China continued on the path of economic reforms, although these uh, reformers of the 80s gradually passed into oblivion, but new reformers emerged and China as you can see here, you know year by year began to grow economy. The red line is the economic uh, growth of China. This is the GDP figures of China in comparison with other important countries. You can see China in red, Japan, US, India, you can see all of them here. So, China gradually took off in the 
80s gradually economically grew, but the major leap was taken in the 90s and 2000s as you can see China growing. Now, China is the second largest economy in the world. You know India is aiming towards becoming that a, a 5 trillion dollar economy as you can see here this is the Indian line the orange one. So, this is the the 5 trillion dollar mark. So, this is the 5 trillion dollar this is uh, 10 trillion dollar this is 15 trillion dollar 20 trillion dollar 25 trillion dollar. So, only America is a more than 25 trillion dollar economy. Japan has slowed down this is Japan's line by the 90s Japan gradually peaked and so there was a plateau and, and they have slowed down, but China has taken off and this all this is because of the reform policies introduced by Tang Xiaoping. So, Tang Xiaoping is considered to be the founder of modern China. Okay. So, he, he took the legacy of Mao Zedong, he survived the, the persecution of Mao and then took his legacy and build a new China introducing market reforms while maintaining the leadership of the communist party and his work has been continued by his successor. Tang Xiaoping eventually died in 1997. So, I stop here, we will continue with the lectures. Uh, for now, let me stop. Thank you. Traditional Chinese thought is based on the Confucian cosmology. So, it is named after Confucius, but this cosmology is a product of generations of Chinese thinkers. And to an extent, even today in China, a kind of uh, a Confucian uh, mindset exists, although it has changed because of the communist revolution. So, uh, According to the Confucian cosmology, at the top is heaven or Thian. Thian is at the top, then below is the earth, heaven at the top, earth at the bottom, in the middle is the sun of heaven. Thian Tzu is the sun of heaven, the Chinese emperor or in modern parlance you will say the Chinese state. So, according to the Confucian cosmology, the Chinese state is uh, an intermediary between heaven which is the truth the cosmic law and us that is uh, the people on earth. So, state plays a very important role in Chinese thinking and at the center of this whole state system that exists on this earth is Chung Kuo the Chinese nation. Chung Kuo is the Chinese nation at the center. In the middle is Qing, the capital where the government resides. So, government is at the center and then there are the Chinese people and beyond that there are two types of people, there are the tributaries and the barbarians. Those people who accept the greatness of Chinese civilization, they follow Chinese leadership are the tributaries and those who refuse to challenge Chinese supremacy are the barbarians. So, this is the ba a kind of a basic structure of Chinese foreign policy. China gives maximum importance to its own people, its own nation, China first and then it has friendly relations with those countries which accept the Chinese conditions. China sometimes is very liberal, those who are ready to accept Chinese conditions, China liberally uh, uh, gives them what they want, but those nations which do not accept the supremacy of China who challenge Chinese hegemony, they are considered to be barbarians. China looks at them with suspicion and does not cede even a, an inch of ground to uh, these countries which, which are barbarians. So, you must keep in mind this 
Chinese cosmology while uh, the, the Confucian cosmology while studying China's foreign policy. Thank you.